Welcome to your final week and lectures in communicating archaeology. In this lecture, we will look at the future of communicating archaeology. While it is ostensibly about the future, it mostly covers the amazing things that are either already happening or are currently being developed. This is inevitably driven by technology. After all, I am the lecturer in digital archaeology and heritage, but we should also try to think about the broader picture. So thinking about prefiguration, when we investigate and disseminate archaeological thought, we should think about what sort of futures we are creating through our reconstructions of the past. Prefigurative politics must lead any reimagination of the past. Prefiguration is the attempt to live as you would go on, to actively create the kinship and power that you would like to foment in the future. Sadly, we often prefigure futures that are actively detrimental to forming more egalitarian, sustainable ways of living. The pandemic has shown us how useful it is to have access to digital archives, artifacts, even entire sites. Yet, as William Gibson has famously stated, the future is already here, it is just not very evenly distributed. There are immense digital archives of cultural materials, but these are far from universal or secure. Which materials are deemed important enough to digitize, to make available, to maintain in perpetuity? Which parts of our past are thus made obscure, inessential, or invisible? We must attend future history by querying which sites, structures, and artifacts are digitized and distributed, and which are left unspoken and offline. Otherwise, we are at risk of creating a future history that is that continues with our currently and blatantly disastrous adherence to capital and state. As archaeologists James Flexner and Edward Gonzalez Tennant state, an important line of inquiry stems from dissatisfaction with and deep skepticism of linear narrative building that places capital and the state as inevitable endpoints of cultural evolution. The International Workers of the World and the International Labor Union have a commitment to forming the structure of the new society within the shell of the old. A prefigurative method for communicating archaeology means that we must stop building 3D castles and temples that erase the labor of the people who build them. We must understand the waste generated by mining for materials to create digital infrastructure and the exploitive practices of tech companies who create our tools. We must engage with Bill Carraher's slow archaeology, which queries the methods that we use to record archaeology at the cost of skilled craftspersonship and the acceleration strategies of late capitalism. We must rethink intellectual property and museum practice to address structural oppression and colonialism. A bit heavy, right? In this module, you have learned many different ways to visually communicate archaeology. We have illustration here in the form of Maiden Castle Hillfort and associated artifacts. We've learned photography. What are you getting from this nice oblique aerial photograph that you did not get from the illustration? A sense of scale, wonder, but what are you missing? Oh, music, obviously. Here's a drone video of Maiden Castle. Does a flyover give you a better sense of scale of the surrounding landscape? I'll link to that in the VLE so you can watch the rest of it. Do we get a better sense of landscape with a map? We get an actual scale this time and pleasing contours as well. Or maybe you're like me and like a sweet little scale model made with tiny invaders and glue. Or a 3D model might be useful to manipulate and provide a relatively detailed overall representation of the structure of Maiden Castle. To be honest, separating out all of these visualization strategies is important as they have their own histories and trajectories within archaeology. Each has added something important to our understanding of past people and has been used in different ways to communicate this understanding to others. 
but we have done you a slight disservice in that many of the most compelling strategies mix these methods. Learning how to meaningfully integrate this multimedia is incredibly important. So what is the best way to communicate archaeology? We can ask ourselves, who is this for? For now, we will focus on the outward facing interpretation. How do we reach people? How can we infuse them with a sense of wonder or delight or even horror at the past? Can a great 3D model make people care? From the reading this week, Colin Sterling reviews the current state of design in so-called critical heritage experiences with specific reference to immersion, enchantment, and autonomy. Sterling notes the so-called experiential turn, framing an understanding of the past through cultural heritage experiences like, say, the Orvik Center. It was once seen as inauthentic or overly commodifying, but he quotes Cornelius Holtorf in saying, Archaeology and heritage are seen to provide memorable experiences that appeal to many people, telling stories that relate to wider trends and themes of our societies. Immersion is at the intersection of digital design, mixed reality environments, theater, games design, and spatial practice. Immersive experiences, as Sterling states, include multimedia exhibition, virtual and augmented reality technologies, physical installations, and themed participatory events. Whereas enchantment is described by Sarah Perry, meaning that archaeology and heritage sites can enchant us, encouraging an affective response that motivates us to engage with each other and the social context around us. And finally, he covers autonomy, a framework to imagine heritage experiences as experimental spaces that celebrate the autonomy of artistic practice, one that is separate from our everyday experience and is critical of neoliberal regimes that position heritage as creating a community that ignores structural inequality and social justice. These concepts encourage us to create heritage experiences and interpretations that, as Perry states, encourage social bonding and mutual respect, contributing to greater civic welfare. Sterling uses the case studies of the Battle of Orgrave, which was a reenactment of police violence against minors in South Yorkshire, staged by artist Jeremy Deller, two actors playing Erno and Ursula Goldfinger, the architect of Balfram Tower, and his wife during a workshop with current residents animated in an archive, and engaging with low-income housing and the impact on communities, and I Swear to Tell the Truth, a multimedia experience at the Imperial War Museum that was created through interactive storytelling that invited visitors to reconsider truths of the museum. I Swear to Tell the Truth, Encourage visitors to put on a pair of headphones, look out through a virtual hospital window, and revise what they understand about the war in Syria. So, thinking about enchantment, you may consider the VNA's recent VR experience, Curious Alice. I apologize, we do not have VR headsets to send out at this point to demonstrate these, but it's a playful exploration that seems to mirror its content, Alice in Wonderland. as it seems. Use your senses to complete curious challenges. Race against the clock to capture the white rabbit's missing glove. Explore fantastical landscapes. Solve the caterpillar's mind-bending riddles. Defeat the Queen of Hearts in a curious game of croquet. Reward. Right. So, again, I will link to those on the VLE so you may watch the whole thing. So consider Curious Alice versus this VR documentary, which is called Common Ground. 
And from the website, Common Ground explores the notorious Aylesbury Estate, home to thousands of South Londoners, and a concrete monument to the history and legacy of social housing in the UK. The Aylesbury Estate is undergoing a massive regeneration scheme that will see big changes to the community of thousands that live there and call it home. So the film, Common Ground, mixes 360 video and real-time environments to allow people access to areas of the estate itself and the personal spaces of residents in order to examine how design, planning, dreams of utopian living, and political will of the day has affected the ordinary people caught in its midst. Using stereoscopic 360 video, photogrammetry, 3D modeling, and the archive, the viewer enters the world of the estate from its birth in the 1960s, through its decline, and up to its controversial regeneration today. It's a multifaceted documentary that questions notions of community, examines the disenfranchisement and the demonization of the working class, and asks whether current housing policy today is destined to repeat the mistakes of the past. In particular, note the mixed use of photography, illustration, videography, and 3D modeling, all of that is integrated to tell an immersive story about urban heritage. It was a really good place to bring up a family. That's why I chose to live in this area. And that's why I'd like to stay. I don't think you'll ever find a stronger community. My home means an awful lot to me. You know, I've brought a family up there. My late husband died there. Whole community is going to be wiped out from here, and our voice never be heard. London is becoming a city for wealthy people, especially inner city London. We need to go to make way for empty flats for foreign investors. I will be discussing other examples of fashion forward experimentation and communicating archaeology, but I hope that this lecture pushes you to consider the futures you are prefiguring when you interpret and disseminate ideas about the past.